Hello everyone, this is Sasha with the LTRC. Thank you for joining us for convenient and compliant accepting payments electronically with our sponsor Tabs 3 as part of the LTRC Industry Insights Series held every Wednesday. Our speaker today is Myrna Johns. Myrna Johns is a Senior Training and Implementation Specialist for Tabs 3 Software. If you had once asked what she wanted to be when she grew up, she would have answered a teacher, lawyer, computer guru, and accountant. Today, she teaches lawyers and law firm staff how to use their software to manage their practice and its billing and accounting. A longtime resident of Lincoln, Nebraska, Myrna has been an employee of Software Technology since 1994 and joined the training team in 2002. Since then, Myrna has led one-on-one -on -one classroom and web-based training to help Tabs 3 get the most out of their software. For joining us today. Um, go ahead and start the survey, Sasha. We're going to start with just a quick survey to find out where everybody is at with accepting credit cards. Do you accept credit cards? Do you accept them through LaPay, through ProPay, through a local bank, another payment processor? Or no, you don't accept credit cards currently. And so it looks like we have a group of people. We have people that go through LawPay, which is a very well-known payment processor, people that go through um, another payment processor direct through their bank, or some of you do not currently accept credit cards. So hopefully we'll give you some answers that'll help you to see how great accepting credit cards or electronic payments can be. So let's go ahead and get started. We have some goals on what we wanted to cover today. So for today's session, I wanted you to learn five ways that you can reduce your accounts receivable. I want you to understand the difference between credit cards, rewards cards, debit cards, and ACH or e-check payments. Find out how to safely store payment information without running afoul of the PCI DSS standards and understand the importance of working with illegal specific payment card vendors and how to ensure compliance with state regulations. So prior to my time here at Tabs 3, I used to work for a collection agency. And granted, that was a long time ago. But reduction of accounts receivable balances is actually one of the things I really enjoy talking about and learning about. And one of the best ways that I find people can reduce accounts receivable is to get the money up front, except retainers. So your client has paid in advance. I know you can't always do that depending on your type of law um, and other different situations, maybe it's not gonna work, but when you can, it works great. Different products are gonna work a little bit differently, but many are adding the ability to automatically pay the client's bill from that retainer. So you don't have to keep track of how much each client owes you or how much each client has in trust. So you're not sitting there going through two different reports trying to say, oh, I can pay from this person and I can pay this person. In our software, we have the ability to set that up and you can set and you different defaults. So the defaults might be to use a previous balance, which in some states, the client has to have their bill in advance. In some states, they don't. Um, so you might be able to do just the current work, or maybe you want to include both of them, which is really the most common method of accepting that and having those retainers be automatic. Since different states have different regulations, you want to find the option that is going to best keep you in compliance. Of course, you also want to have a good engagement letter. Um, looks like I got ahead there. The engagement letter can really help your process. Some firms have even created a zero AR policy by making an agreement with the client to store payment card or bank account information and automatically withdraw payment if the client has not made a payment within, say, 28 days or 45 days or 60 days. Later in the session, we're going to give you some tips on safely storing this information. I'll give you a hint, writing it down and locking it in a, a vault or in a cabinet is not the best way to do that. Um, if you don't already do so, you want to bill regularly and soon after you have finished the work. Some very ma active matters may be best served if you bill every two weeks instead of once a month. Of course, that's only going to work well if you're entering time every day as you work it, which is another session entirely, another favorite thing for me to talk about, um, because the more you get your time in, the easier it is to get the bills out. If your state allows it, charge interest or late fee if your clients don't pay on time. I often encourage our tabs three users to set a generous grace period, like 30, 45, or 60 days. If your client pays right away, they don't see the interest unless they exceed that day. 
And I have firms that'll just put that in the engagement letter, even if they're not ready to implement it. And then only after the client fails to pay multiple times, do they turn that feature on for that matter. For us, since it's a matter specific charge, we can turn it on and turn it off for each individual person to make sure that it works really well. Once your client owes you on a bill, be sure to send reminders. Most software should have the ability to do that automatically when a payment's not received. Again, in training sessions, I frequently remind people and recommend that they should send those with yellow paper. Um, yellow paper helps you when you see that so that your clients know they're serious. I mean, for me, it really came to a head when I had a father was ill and, you know, he was picking up his mail. He was supposed to be mailing off his bill payments and he wasn't. And I just noticed his bill started turning yellow and just had that conversation. It was a great way to take that over, um, took it off his, his plate and was a lot easier for him. Uh, track your collection efforts. I used to work at a collection agency. As I said before, we recorded every attempt at collection, every message. It might be a voicemail. It might be somebody else answering the phone. Let's face it, when people are having problems paying their bills, they know it, and they often don't want to answer those calls. When your client says they didn't know, you can point out the dates and times of your efforts, and clients can take that more seriously. If you do eventually need to file a lawsuit, that information can be invaluable to know how many attempts you made to collect that debt. Finally, you want to make sure that it's easy for your clients to pay you. For most firms, this means accepting payments electronically. Think about when you do get in touch with a delinquent client, okay? Instead of having them write a check, find an envelope, put a stamp on the envelope, take that envelope to the mailbox and send it, which they might not even remember to do that, even if they do the first few steps, you can just take their information over the phone and process that payment. It's easier for you and easy for them. So why should we accept electronic payments? Some of the concerns that I hear from law firms are the extra work involved in accepting payments online. You might be afraid of fraud um, affecting the payments that you receive, maybe the security of payment card information. And if you've ever had to do the long drawn out PCI DSS testing, uh, you know what I'm talking about. It can take a long time to make sure that you're not in violation of something. And of course, there's the cost of accepting credit cards. And I feel like those are really easily outweighed by the benefits that payment cards can provide. First, as a general rule, it's actually less work to accept payments electronically than it is to receive your checks in the mail and deposit them in your bank. And it makes it easier for your clients to pay you. The speed with which you get paid is actually one of the reasons that it is generally going to be a better way for you to work. Um, it's generally worth the cost. Since you don't have to spend time collecting, that time can be used for billable work. Having accounts receivable costs you money and studies show that the sooner you get paid, the more likely your clients are to pay you in, in full. Another reason for accepting credit cards, try asking a young person to write a check. Uh, my boss actually brought this tip up because his daughter has this ally bank and it's wholly online. And a lot of young adults today don't even have access to checks. So you might not be servicing them right now, but eventually they're going to get to that point where they're needing legal services and they're not even going to have that ability to write a check to make a payment. And of course, the final reason, your clients want you to accept credit cards or accept payments online. It's easy for them. I know I personally rarely write checks anymore. I just pop on my phone, pay my bills online. It's fast and it's easy that way. And accepting payments electronically doesn't just mean credit cards to your client. I know I use that term a lot, but let's break down some of the electronic payment standards. First, we have the credit cards, okay? Those are pretty standard. Basically, the card owner fills out an application. Bankers approve them to have a revolving loan at the bank, which typically carry high rates if you carry a balance. There's several parties involved in each of those transactions. There's the payment processor who handles the physical part of the transaction, the credit card bank, the financial institution that issues the card like Capital One, Chase, Bank of America. There's the network like Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, and of course your bank where the money gets deposited. Each of these people wants to take their cut of the transaction and those fees are going to vary. This is especially true with rewards cards. 
Initially, it was airline mile cards, and that's really become to be more of a popular cash back card. Not only are they convenient, we get money back. I love using my cash back cards. It's great. It's fast. But where does that cash come back from? Well, the people that we pay. Different payment processors handle it differently. So you might go with a payment processor that's going to give you an all-in-one price that includes a single rate for all cards. Others will give you a price and then add on the interchange fees and the visa transaction fees and other little items. You want to make sure if you're comparing vendors that you start looking at how they do that and what you're currently charging. A lot of them, they will um, be willing to look at a couple months worth of bills if you're already accepting credit cards and make sure that you're getting the right price. They can break it down for you. Another type of card is the debit card. Initially, debits card only worked at ATMs. I remember when I got my first one, I was young, we won't say when, uh, but you know, you could only go to your money machine and pull out your money. Eventually they started putting Visa or MasterCard on them. And those stamps have been getting put on so that they can work on different systems. Most of the integrated payment vendors actually process these debit card transactions as a credit card or what's consult, uh, considered in the industry a signature debit. That means that it's expected that they print a receipt and you sign it, which we know has kind of gone away, but it's still called a signature debit. Even when run as a signature debit, though, these cards have limits that are usually lower depending on the issuing bank. So you might be limited to a maximum charge of five or $700 per payment transaction. As I mentioned, there's a charge for credit card processing, and this charge should be different for the signature debit transaction. It's actually considered a completely different um, area of process, and so there are regulations as to what can happen with your credit card charges. For example, some of our clients have been requesting the ability to add a surcharge to the bills to cover their credit card change fees. We're looking into this as an option in states where it's legal, but debit cards and state regulatory considerations mean we can't just blanket add that feature because some states do not allow it. And some states allow it, but only if you say, well, we offer a cash discount. So you have to be careful on that. Um, some firms, because we don't have it as a feature, are doing it on their own, but you have to be careful if you do. There are different regulations that cover these debit cards and it is actually illegal to add a surcharge to debit cards. Even if you can run it on a credit card, even if you run it as a credit card, keep in mind that because there's a lower price point on that and that is also regulated, you're not gonna lose as much and the maximum that you might have is maybe $10 as a charge because again, the debit cards can only go up so high. Finally, there is an ACH or electronic check option. Some of you have payers who will deposit money right into your account automatically using an ACH transaction. ACH transfers are electronic bank-to-bank -bank money transfers processed through the automated clearinghouse network. According to NACHA, which is the association responsible for these transfers, the ACH network is a batch processing system that banks and other financial institutions use to aggregate these transactions for processing, which typically happens fairly frequently. Uh, but not, you know, every minute or every hour or anything like that. Another name we have seen used a lot is electronic check because it's a common name and you use the items found on a check. So you look at a check and at the bottom, you're going to have a routing number. It's a nine digit number that identifies the bank and then the account number, which will be used to initiate the transfer of funds. So now that we have an understanding of some of the types of payments that might be handled through the payment card industry, let's talk about security. Earlier, I mentioned PCI DSS, and it's right here on the screen for you, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards. It's a standard that ensures all payment card information stays secure. You might be thinking, well, Home Depot or Target, pretty big box stores, couldn't keep it secure. And you should know, number one, they got in trouble and were required to make reparations to help secure those that might have been affected. They do still fall under that umbrella. They just, just because the regulation exists, doesn't always mean it's always followed. If your business accepts payments by any method of payment card, you follow under regulations that require you to meet minimum standards. Typically, firms have to undergo annual compliance testing or fill out a checklist to make sure that they don't have to do specific testing. This testing might take a long time to complete depending on the information that your firm has the ability to store. 
most of the software today is going with an online portal to payment card sites where the information is not stored on the computer so that you don't have to do a lot of that intensive testing. That's really good for you and your clients because this is the way that your customer's information is kept secure. But it requires more than just using software that falls into these compliance areas. Let's stop and talk about these standards for a minute. I'm not going to read all these. <laughs> In a nutshell, these are the key requirements for PCI DSS compliance. When you sign up for a merchant account to accept payment cards, you agree that you will do all these things. They give you actually huge books of things that you agree to. It seems complicated, but keep in mind you can use some simple rules to ensure you keep information secure. The key things you want to be able to uh, make sure that you do are, first of all, maintain a firewall. You should do this anyway to protect your client information from outside hacking. It's just a, a legal standard that you should be held to. You want to make sure you change any passwords from the standard passwords that come with the software. Defaults are easy for anyone to guess. While there may be times I might recommend somebody use a blank password uh, for somebody that doesn't have to do a lot, I do recommend that anybody that does anything securely should have a very secure password. You want to make sure you don't store card information. If you do, store it only with secure merchants. Our co company makes um, a product and you can add custom fields wherever you want. It would make it very easy for you to go ahead and type that credit card information in there, but it's not something you should do. Because the software isn't intended to store that information, we don't have it go through the testing that's necessary to ensure that it can be kept secure at the level the payment card information needs to be kept secure. Additionally, you want to make sure that you limit who has access to your credit card information. With the providers that we accept for tabs three, we check them out. We ensure that the only time you have access to the card information is the time you enter it. When you hand the card back to the client, you only have access to those last few digits on the card so that you can confirm that it's the right card. Other than that, there should be no reason to keep any of that information. Finally, you want to make sure you have a good virus scanner in place. Uh, there may be folders you do, might not want to real-time scan, but you should have real-time scans going on and regular virus scanning to make sure that all of your information is secure and somebody hasn't somehow installed a key checker that tracks all the things that you type. So when you type in a credit card, it's capturing it then, not when it's being sent. So here's some things to not do. Don't encourage your clients to send you payment information in an email and have a plan for if they do, because some are going to try it. You need to be sure that you delete it, remove it from your deleted items. And of course, at that point, it might still exist on your email server. So if you can scrub that too, it would be best. And it would provide a service to your client. Plus, being their attorney, you can give them some recommendations and hopefully they'll listen to you. Uh, send them and let them know they should not be sending credit card information in an email. That's a pick up the phone item, not a send an email item. Don't use unsecured Wi-Fi. I'm um, sorry, my screen kind of popped out of here. Let me go back to where I was there. There we go. Um, don't use unsecured Wi-Fi. With the unsecured Wi-Fi, you have the possibility that somebody could capture that information. So what makes a Wi-Fi secure? Let's say you go to a hotel, right? Everybody has the same password. It's not really that secure. Or you might see the words unsecured Wi-Fi. Again, um, that's not secure. But if you have your own internal Wi-Fi in your office and you have it secured you have it with a known group and it's secured and it's limited to certain people, absolutely. Go ahead and use that Wi-Fi. Don't write the information down in a notebook or keep it in a drawer. That's not very secure. Um, even if everybody at your, your firm has been identified as being secure, somebody may run into a problem. We hear a lot about people um, losing money when they're gambling and they have a gambling addiction. Uh, we wouldn't want them to have access to that information. Not that they would, but not having that access is helpful. Uh, plus, if you do pass all the testing, that's one of the things they check for. They really don't want you to store that information and write it down. If you need to keep a written copy for a short time, like when you received it in email, be sure that it is stored in a locked location and only certain people have access to it. 
and don't keep it for long. You should cross shred it as soon as possible. Again, if you get that payment information in a written form, whatever you do, don't dispose of the information carelessly. You may trust the person who empties your trash and they may be very trustworthy, but they may not be aware of the need to dispose of that information in a secure manner. So it's really important that you're cross cut shutting it and making it so that nobody can read that information if they do get a hood. Finally, don't neglect the need to have these policies in place and make sure that you have good policies and follow them. None of the steps is incredibly difficult. You just need to keep aware of what you should do. And that's why in the legal industry, we want to make sure you're using legal specific payment vendors. Some of the top vendors that come to my mind are Tabstreet Pay, Cosmolex Pay, ProPay, LawPay, LexCharge. Uh, those are just the top ones that I see in the ads that I get in my email all the time. There may be others that are out there. One of the best features about all of these providers is they specifically know your needs and work with the legal industry. They will deposit the full amount of the payment in your account. You might be using other providers like Square or PayPal. Square or PayPal will take their fees right out of each payment. So your client pays you $100 and you get a deposit of 96. Your bookkeepers hate this, I guarantee it. It's much easier to verify the charges line up with the amount taken from the client if the dollar amounts match. Another great part about all of these mentioned vendors is that they understand trust regulations. Every state sets their own regulations, but they all frown on companies taking money out of your trust. With some non-legal specific vendors, firms might have only set up their payments to go into their operating account and then they have to manually transfer the funds to trust and make sure that they're they're keeping that step whenever you rely on a manual process sometimes something gets forgotten every legal specific vendor i've worked with will deposit into trust and then take those funds out of operating if you're getting a fee or a chargeback and so that really helps a lot so let's see how accepting credit cards can help us in tabs three, the software I work with most, I can add a payment method for any of my clients by clicking on manage payment methods. When I do this, I start with nothing. I simply add a payment method and fill out the information on the screen. I complete that with the debit and credit card information or the bank account information. So I can do those ACHs. Once I submit the information, the payment method I choose is associated with my client. Most of the software that I've seen products actually store a token. That means that the only information you have access to is what you see on the screen. A few digits, the expiration date, the name of the client. I will never be able to view more than that because it's all stored at the payment processor site and they are much more secure. When I go to enter the payment, my payment options include the American Express and eCheck information that I added for that client. I just enter the amount and press apply. Furthermore, I can add a payment option, so when I send my bills by email, there's a link for clients to enter their own payment information. I never see their credit card information. It adds another layer to the security of the payment because it's all under the control of our client the whole time. Let's kind of go through that really quick here, kind of live. When I click on the payment option, I just click here. So that's, you know, client gets their email, tells them how much they owe, there's their bill. They click here to make a payment. Okay, didn't click hard enough apparently. So when I make that payment, all I have to do is fill out the information and hit pay. So I've already got that filled out in this other window just to make it faster for our session. I'm just gonna go ahead and pay that and put that information in. So here's the cool thing. When I go into my tabs three, it's right there. So I paid $595 and there's that $595 right up at the top ready for me to accept that charge makes it super easy for the clients to pay and all i have to do to get that in my system i'm going to make that a silent payment just import it that's it i'm done i've got that money how easy is that so all i have to do is import those payments that are sitting waiting for me the money's deposited in the bank pretty quickly even if you don't import it the money still gets deposited but um, you know i can get it recorded i don't have to go in and look up the client it's all right there faster than a client can get a check in the mail to me and my staff doesn't have to open the mail look up the client apply the payment fill out the deposit slip just to get that money accounted for it just import it right in 
It makes sense to use features like that and makes it super easy for your clients to pay you. So in conclusion, for law firms, accepting payments electronically is safe, simple, and fast. And it's a great way to ensure that your clients pay you quickly and reduce your accounts receivable. So if you'd like more information on either the products you've seen um, that I showed you or even on just collecting payments, go ahead and email me at training at tabstory.com. I'll be glad to respond to you. And then I think we're also ready to go to our Q&A. Great, thanks, Myrna. Um, so no questions as of right now, but we do have a question that we ask all of our speakers and that's whether you have any predictions for the legal industry post COVID. So to say, do I have any predictions for the legal industry post COVID? I think that we are going to see a lot more of people working remotely. Um, and I think that's pretty much standard for everybody. So having the remote access, being able to access um, information to send out your bills electronically. So emailing those bills, if firms haven't already gotten to that, they should really be moving to that. Um, accessing everything that you do remotely so that you can move and work from home is gonna be a really big change we're going to see. Um, in the industry. So a lot of firms have gone back to people working in the office, but I think we'll see a little bit more of a, uh, some people work remotely, some people work in the office and everybody has that capability when they need it. Great, thank you. Um, that is all the time that we're gonna have for today. I would like to thank our sponsor Tab3 and all of you for attending our webinar today. If you're curious about future webinars, you can check out the ABA LPRC page or follow our Twitter at LPRC for updates. I would also like to thank Myrna for presenting today. You can keep up with Tab3 at Tab3 Software on Twitter or Tab3.com. We will now conclude the webinar. Bye, everyone.